So in today's lecture, we're going to talk about how biological diversity evolves. Last time we talked about Darwin and his theory of evolution. We talked about how evolution takes place, natural selection and descent with modification. And now we're going to actually kind of put those ideas in, into action and see how does this diversity evolve? How do we get the extreme amount of species different organisms that we have on the planet. So one of Darwin's main ideas was this idea of natural selection and the way that organisms become adapted to their environment. Now remember within an organism they don't evolve but it's from generation to generation that evolution can take place. So if an organism has a specific characteristic that allows it to survive and reproduce at higher rates it's then going to have more offspring with that specific trait. And so that's how we get things like lizards that look exactly like leaves and fish that blend in and look like they're basically rocks. Um, how penguins now basically fly underwater. They've lost their ability to fly in the air, but they're streamlined and are able to dive to kind of extreme depths to get their food and how an organism like the camel can live in a pretty hostile environment and do very well. This is through the process of natural selection. Now, since Darwin published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, there have been lots of new discoveries, lots of advances in technology that have allowed kind of scientists a way to look at evolution in different ways. And one of the way, main ways that scientists like to look at evolution is through this process called speciation. And speciation is going to be kind of when one species, and I'm going to define what this word species means in a second, but when one group of organisms splits into two different types. Okay, so they're closely related, but they're no longer going to be the same. And so here we have a really good example. We have the land-dwelling iguana that can be found on the mainland of Ecuador. Um, they live in trees, they are spend their whole entire life on land. And then we have the marine iguana that evolved on the Galapagos. And so these are two different species. They are very closely related. They are sister species, what we would call them. Um, but they can no longer come into contact and be able to interbreed. Um, and so this process of speciation has taken place. So what is a species? The word species has kind of this Latin meaning of kind or appearance. And so we think of things as being in the same species of being the same kind, have the same appearance. When we talk about the biological species concept, this means a group of organisms that can interbreed with one another. Okay, so they are able to have fertile offspring. So if you have a male and a female come together, mate, they then can have offspring that are fertile and can then reproduce their own offspring. We're going to start talking about this process of speciation and the ability to interbreed is very important. Two species that are, are different enough, they will not be able to interbreed. Okay, so sometimes you can have hybrids that can be produced that are kind of a combination of two different species, but usually something's wrong or there's going to be some issue. But we're going to, in general, think about kind of speciation as having two groups of organisms that can no longer interbreed with each other. There's been too many changes that have happened genetically, behaviorally, that they will no longer mate with each other. Okay, because of this, there are certain situations where we can't really use the biological species concept. So, for example, if we have asexual organisms, we can't really classify them in the same way. Bacteria, very difficult for us to kind of categorize with a species um, because they're so similar, and, but they also evolve very quickly. And so we don't tend to go to like species levels with certain groups. We also can't use the biological species concept with fossils because they're no longer living and we can only tell so much from the bones. Now, when we talk about species, it's important that you can look at multiple different things. 
And so sometimes you're going to be looking at physical traits. So how similar are their feathers, their coloration patterns, things like that. We also can look at purely molecular data because sometimes things look very similar. So for example, in this picture, these two birds I think for most of us that aren't birders would think are the same exact species. But in fact, they are not the same species at all and do not interbreed. And so one way that we can actually identify that is that you can do molecular data, look at their actual genomes and see that they are not the same species. And we also can look at kind of shared ancestry. So how things are related to each other. Um, do they share a common ancestor? The reason why we put humans on this, we have this image of these different people, is because while we look different from each other, we are all in the same species. Okay, and so physical appearance alone is not going to be a very good category of determining if you have different species. So there is a human species, we're Homo sapiens, um, and so we're all in that. Now, when we start talking about this process of speciation, again, it is really important to think about breeding, so sexual reproduction. Now, when we talk about speciation, there is going to be some thing, some mechanism that is going to prevent two groups of organisms from being able to breed with each other, okay? And so these different barriers are going to be called reproductive barriers. So this is anything that's going to prevent interbreeding between closely related groups, okay? Now, the reproductive barriers can take two different forms, kind of major forms, and then within those two forms, there are other kind of ways. But the first is something called a prezygotic barrier. When you hear the word prezygotic, I want you to think pre-baby, okay? So this is before you have a zygote, which ultimately will become a baby. This is going to be something that happens prior to actual mating taking place, okay? And we'll go over a couple examples of that. The second type is something called post-zygotic barriers. Post-zygotic means that there has been egg and, egg and sperm fertilization taking place. You have a zygote which ultimately can become a baby, but something's gonna happen where there's gonna be a barrier that prevents fertile viable offspring, okay? And so if interspecies matings occur, there's gonna be some type of hybrid zygote that forms, and there can be problems with that, that hybrid. And so we'll, we'll talk about what those types of things are. So again, prezygotic before mating attempt, post-zygotic, after a mating attempt, you've are actually already had um, egg fertilized by sperm, you have a zygote, and then we'll start talking about what's going to go wrong. So the first group, this prezygotic, so these are going to happen prior to fertilization. There are going to be five different types that we talk about. The first is going to be temporal isolation. And so we have an image of um, these squir uh, not squirrels, skunks, and the skunks are going to be an example of this temporal isolation. So we have two different species of skunks, and the, the reason why they don't mate with each other is because they mate at different times of the season. And so one of them mates in the spring, another one mates in the fall, and because the females and males are not in reproductive status at the same time, they will not interbreed. Therefore, they are two different species. The next is gonna be habitat isolation. And so our example for habitat, habitat isolation is gonna be this example with garter snakes. So in this situation, habitat means kind of where are they living. We have one species that's going to live in the water and another species that lives on land. And therefore, they're not in the same place. They can live in a very close area to each other, but because one group stays in the water and one group lives on land, they will not run into each other and be able to mate. The next group or type is behavioral isolation. And this is going to be any type of behavior that's going to prevent kind of species from being able to mate with each other. A lot of times it's going to have to do with kind of some type of 
um, sexual courtship that the organisms will not recognize each other as viable mates because they're not doing the right behavior. Um, so that can be an example. And I will actually talk about this um, behavioral isolation in a second. We can then have another um, type called mechanical isolation. And so mechanical isolation has to do with some type of physical barrier. So certain, for example, you can have fertilization of one type of flower, um, but it will not be able to kind of fertilize the other type because it won't have the same um, bird that's fertilizing or pollinating it. And so, for example, we have a hummingbird that is going to um, come in here, feed, get some of the pollen on it, and then it's going to go to other flowers that are the same shape to then also be able to kind of pollinate. But hummingbirds are not going to be able to actually um, come in here and drink out of the nectar of this plant right here, and therefore you cannot have actual fertilization of those two. The last type is going to be called gametic isolation, and this is often going to happen when we have kind of mass um, reproductive events where the organisms just kind of release sperm and egg into the environment. Oops, I forgot to um, put these out. Um, so the gametic isolation again is so female and male are not going, the gametes are unable to unite. Um, there's something usually going to be some kind of a, some type of chemical um, barrier where the sperm and the egg are just not compatible. And so you can have different types of sea urchins, for example. Uh, they're all release their sperm at the same time, but the egg and sperm of only the type of species that are similar to it, will they be able to actually kind of come together? Now, I wanted to talk about behavioral isolation um, specifically because this is kind of what I studied for my PhD. Um, I worked with Costas hummingbirds and the Costas hummingbirds are gonna be right here. And so this is an image of the courtship display that the Costas male performs for female. So in this image, we have a a female that's sitting perched and she is looking at a male who has kind of these crazy feathers that are um, kind of coming out, kind of looks like an octopus almost. And this involves both flying, it involves a song, you can't hear the song in this, but all of this is a behavioral type of isolation. And so we think that this display is showing that to this female, this is, I am the same species as you, we can mate with each other. And so females of a different species will not respond to this type of behavior because they don't recognize it as being, you know, their own mate. This other image right here is going to be blue-footed boobies. And so right here you're seeing with the blue-footed boobies doing their actual courtship display. They have these wing movements. They also do things with their blue feet. And all of this has to be kind of in the right behavioral order for these two birds to recognize that they're in the same species. And so there could be another species that's similar to the blue-footed booby, slightly different, and they will not recognize it as a mate because it doesn't do the right type of behavior. Okay, so again, elaborate courtship rituals are going to be a good example of um, kind of species-specific and specific songs and displays will also be examples of behavioral isolation. For post-psychotic barriers, so re again, remember that this means it's happened after a zygote has formed. So there has been a mating event. Okay, so there's, if it's a post-psychotic barrier, that means that there was nothing preventing these two um, different species from mating. Okay, so they were able to mate, they have of, of a zygote, but there are going to be some issues for two groups if they are truly different species. So some of the post-zygotic barriers include re um, reduced hybrid viability. And so this is when you have two species that come together, they are able to mate, but the offspring are just not viable. They're not as good, they're not as healthy, something's wrong with them and they're going to tend to die before they can make um, kind of offspring of their own. 
The next, ex next example is going to be reduced hybrid fertility. And so in this case, you can actually have a completely healthy hybrid offspring, but they're infertile, and so they cannot make their own offspring. A really good example of this are the horse and donkey making a mule. Okay, and so we have this example right here. So when you cross a horse with a donkey, you get a mule. Mules are extremely strong. They're, you know, we would breed them. They would um, perform kind of farm work. But unfortunately, or I guess it doesn't really matter to them, but they are infertile. It has to do with a chromosome in um, incompatibility because horses and donkeys do not have the same number of chromosomes. For some reason, it allows for one generation to be fine, but then two mules cannot have, um, you know, make another mule. That's just not how it works. So that would be a reduced hybrid fertility. The last type that we're going to talk about is something called hybrid breakdown, where you actually have a viable fertile offspring from two different species, the first generation, but then the second generation starts to become feeble or it becomes sterile. And so in this example, we have um, a plant. So we have kind of, you know, maybe the first generation would be fine and the second generation would be fine. But then by the third generation, you start to have kind of a very feeble or sterile um, plant. So now we know how the reproductive barriers can take place. So we can have pre-zygotic barriers and post-zygotic barriers. However, those things kind of come after what we're going to talk about right now. So this is going to be kind of mechanisms of speciation. So this is going to be kind of the first event that will then lead to pre-zygotic and post-zygotic barriers to form. And so what's going to happen is we have to have kind of a a parent species, so this is going to be a group of species, and so in this example, we're going to have kind of this group of trees right here. So this is the parent species, and there's going to be something that happens, and it's going to have, there's two different ways this can happen, but something's going to happen so that we end up having two different species of trees. So we have kind of this dark green and this light green um, there, and then this one's a little bit hard to see, but you have kind of light green trees, and then you have these darker green trees on the outside. Now, the two mechanisms are going to um, kind of happen in different ways. Okay, so the first one, which is going to be this, this group right here, this allopatric speciation, is going to be when there is an actual physical barrier to gene flow. Okay, so remember, gene flow is what happens when we have mating. We're kind of combining different groups of, or, um, of genes. They're coming together, making a new offspring. And so there's gene flow. In this population right here, there's gene flow between all of these trees because their pollen can move around and basically fertilize any of the different trees. However, if all of a sudden you then have a mountain range that starts to form, that is now a physical barrier. And so this is gonna happen, this is gonna take place over you know, long, long period of time, but a mountain range can start to form, which then cuts off the two different sides of the mountain, and those trees can no longer have gene flow between them. So they are physically isolated from each other. And so the, you have kind of a wall, this barrier that's going to happen, and that is going to be allopatric speciation. The second type of speciation is the one that's a little more difficult to understand because in this situation, there is no mountain that's forming. You actually just have kind of something's happening where a group of trees are starting to have some type of barrier between them, some reproductive barrier, but it has nothing to do with genetic or geographic isolation. So the first type of speciation we're going to talk about is allopatric. So the big thing about allopatric is that there's going to be some physical barrier preventing interbreeding with these two different groups. Okay, and usually it's going to involve some type of geological process, um, formation of a mountain range, um, splitting of continental plates. Uh, it could be a volcano erupting and creating this barrier. Um, there's lots of different types of things. And also can be man-made things like walls or roads or anything like that. 
Now what happens is these two groups, so if we have an original parent population and somehow they have now a, a barrier in between them, a physical barrier, during their isolation from each other, evolution is going to continue to take place. Mutations are going to continue to take place. And through that process, they're going to start changing from each other genetically. So they no longer are going to have exactly the same genes. Okay. And what can happen is you can start to get these reproductive barriers that start to arise. And what happens is if these two groups then come back together, so just say there was a wall or a road and then all of a sudden it's, you know, get rid of it or build a bridge over it so that we can have migration and gene flow. If the two species come back together and they can no longer breed with one another, then we consider them kind of speciated from each other. And so there are two different species at this point. A good example of this are uh, two species of antelope squirrels that live on either side of the Grand Canyon. And so at one point, these two species were one species. Um, they were able to cross from one side of the Grand Canyon to the other, but because of geological processes, the, the Grand Canyon has gotten wide enough that it has prevented them from going back and forth anymore, which then has isolated the two different species and they are now um, reproductively isolated from each other and they will not be able to breed. So the big thing about the speciation, occur seeing if speciation has evolved, is to look at what happens when the two groups come back together. If you have kind of on this first, this top one, so if you have some barrier that comes around, okay, so it could be a mountain range, and you have then the two groups, you have one group over on this side, one group over on this side, oops, and they are no longer able to kind of be with each other, they're going to evolve, lots of things are going to happen. If they come back, together and they're still able to breed, then we say that there's no speciation and they actually are still the same species, okay? If, however, we have the same population group, they're all together, then the geographical barrier prevents them from having gene flow. If they come back together in the same place and they no longer can interbreed, then we would say, yes, there is speciation taking place. This, these two are no longer the same species they're very closely related, but they're not the same species. The second type of speciation is called sympatric speciation. And this one is a little more confusing and hard to understand because it's easy to know, understand why a physical barrier will prevent mating from taking place because they physically can't come into contact with each other. But in sympatric speciation, there is no barrier. Okay, so they're in the same place at the same time, but something's going to happen that's going to cause them to start kind of getting these reproductive barriers to form. So there are a couple different things that can happen that would form sympatric speciation. One of them is called polyploidy, and this is not a word that we've used yet, but I want you to think of this last word, ploid. We have heard that kind of root word. We've heard diploid and haploid. So in, we're talking about poly, polyploidy, we're talking about the number of chromosomes. And so sometimes, and this happens in plants mostly, um, although it can happen in animals, you have an accident during cell division and you end up with extra set of chromosomes, but it's not going to kind of damage the organism. It actually just makes them into a new type, okay? The second main type is going to be habitat complexity. So if there is a very complex habitat and organisms in a species start to specialize on specific areas of the habitat, they can then basically separate themselves and isolate themselves based on how they kind of use the habitat, okay? And the last type um, of sympatric speciation would be sexual selection. So this is when certain males and certain females are going to be attracted to a specific phenotype. And if it's a strong enough kind of selection, they can then start to only mate with the one phenotype, which then can kind of start to drive these two groups um, into speciation. Now here's an example of, of this. 
if we have kind of this is one species they have kind of a blue form and a red form and this is going to be kind of the habitat co complexity example where you have kind of different lay levels and depths of water and at certain depths you are going to have sensitivity to blue light or to blue light and blue coloration is favored um, and then at deeper you have kind of a sensitivity to red light and red coloration is going to be favored and so over time what can happen is that if the two groups kind of if blue males wander down into kind of deeper water uh, they're not going to be very successful so they, they tend to stay up in the area where they're you know the most attractive looking which is higher because that's where the blue sensitivity is and if red males tend to stay lower and kind of we have the females going after kind of the same color that they are we can start to have this process of speciation taking place okay so hopefully again i know this one's a little more complicated because it has to do with kind of behavior and the habitat and this one it has to do with like light and sensitivity um, but they're all in the same location it's just kind of a preference or sexual selection habitat complexity that's going to cause this speciation to start to happen now polyploidy is one of the main examples of how this happens and there are two different types of polyploidy um, that can lead to speciation the first one is when you have kind of a single parent species and you have some issue with the cell division you can end up with kind of double the chromosome number than the normal um, and so instead of being 2n you can end up being the tetraploid so that's one version the second type is when you have kind of polyploid speciation where you have two different species that have this but then they are able to interbreed so this actually does happen and so this is a gray tree frog and in this image right next to the gray tree frog they have kind of an example of how they think uh, the different species have actually formed um, we have kind of the gray tree frog has a 4n um, but we think it probably came from different species that had 2n so if you look in these ones it says like 2n it says a 2n it says a 2n and then it has 4n 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 and so we're seeing that there's some difference in the number of chromosomes they're having polyploidy and that's leading to the speciation the this other image is of a Chinese hibiscus and this is another example of a polyploid so it's um, it happens in plants quite often and this is just kind of showing how that would take place where you can have species a species b they can have different numbers of chromosomes um, for some reason when if there's fertilization between these two different species and we have this polyploidy issue they actually will just create a new species so one place that shows a lot of speciation are really good to look at for speciation are going to be islands and specifically volcanic islands so these are islands that are started from volcanoes they start off you know not even being um, breaking the surface of the ocean but once they break the surface then they are exposed um, different colonists can start to arrive via the winds or um, the ocean currents you can get birds that can start landing on these volcanic islands and usually these organisms are coming from other places it could be a uh, mainland kind of on a continent and those places are most likely going to be different from their new environment and so the organisms that land there have to um, adapt or they will not last so what happens is if you have organisms that have the traits that allow them to kind of do well in this new environment they will thrive they will have lots of offspring and they will then have um, kind of a better a bigger population on that island now the islands um, specifically the Galapagos and Hawaiian islands there are multiple islands in both of these so uh, what happens is that you can actually have very different types of habitats on the different islands which then can allow them to have evolution or speciation in different ways and so one example of this is the the Darwin's finches where we think the Darwin's finches originated from one species of finch but then they moved over onto the Galapagos Islands and different islands and there are now 14 different species of closely related finches there 
Okay, they all are have finch-like traits, but they differ in how they've used the habitat and how they feed specifically. And so their beaks are going to be different um, and they're adapted to feed on different types of things. So you can have a woodpecker finch. This one uses a tool to eat insects, a cactus seed eater um, or an insect eater. And so all of them are gonna have their beaks that are adapted to specific types of food. Okay, and so that's going to allow them, if they have a beak that works really well for a specific type of food, they'll be able to utilize that resource, have lots of babies and continue to live there. Now, the process of speciation is something that is hard to see on a kind of a lifetime scale. So if we think about, you know, what's happening in our lives, are we going to see speciation events? Um, we can see microevolutionary change in our lifetimes because we can see how things can change over a few generations. For example, flus and viruses, they evolve very quickly and um, we can actually experience those microevolutionary changes. And I just want to remind you that microevolution is going to be the changes in allele frequencies. So kind of on a, we're looking at the small level of how the alleles are changing from generation to generation. Um, but there are sometimes ways that you can see a speciation occurring, um, but it's harder to see. It's not something that is going to be um, as easy because speciation events often take place over long periods of time. And so we kind of see the final result. We look at Darwin's finches and we see all these finches. They've adapted to these different types of food sources, but we haven't actually seen the process of speciation where there was one group that then starts to diverge into these different species. But researchers have been able to document about two dozen cases where populations are diverging. And most of these populations have something to do with kind of the use of different food resources, or they start to breed in different habitats. And so um, scientists are studying these as we speak and are seeing how they are kind of having speciation take place in front of their eyes. While it's difficult to see speciation kind of within our lifetimes, one thing that we can look at is the fossil record. And so the fossil record is going to be a historical record of different organisms that have lived throughout the age of the earth. There have kind of been surveys that have looked at 84 groups of plants and animals, and they've looked at the kind of speed of speciation. And the speciation can take anywhere from 4 million years for two species to basically completely become um, a species or something along the lines of 4,000 years. And so speciation is going to happen at different rates um, in different organisms. Now, what we can see are kind of all the speciation events um, that and extinctions that have taken place through the fossil record. Obviously, we're not seeing every single group and every single species and iteration that these have gone through. But if we have fossils of certain groups, we can then see how they've changed over time. And so, for example, we have um, with these horses, you can look at kind of the, the timeline. So down here at the bottom, we have 55 million years ago and up here would be more towards modern day. And by looking at both teeth and forelimbs and feet, they have been able to look at how we have these different groups. Um, how they have changed over time, okay? And so we can see ancestral forms, um, something that looks very different from a horse to then after, you know, these ones basically look like horses to us, um, just different sizes. But if you look at their teeth, their molars and other things are gonna be slightly different. So you can kind of see the progression um, in the fossil record. So we're now going to start talking about macroevolution, which is going to be kind of evolutionary change above the species level. So we originally, when we talked about Darwin and all of his ideas, we talked about microevolution, which again is going to be kind of changes in allele frequency. When we look at microevolution, we're looking at kind of the big picture of things. So how new species are formed over time? How do we get these different groups of organisms? and kind of look at them through their historical um, record.
When we look at macroevolution, we're going to look at things like mass extinction. So these events in time where you know, more than 50% of the life on Earth goes extinct and is never going to be seen again except in fossils. We're going to look at the diversity of life. So how did all these different groups of organisms arise? And we're also going to look at these really kind of key adaptations like flight, like sight, the eye, um, and see kind of how those things evolved on a broad scale. Flight is something that evolved in multiple different groups. It didn't evolve just once. It's going to evolve multiple times within the insects. It's going to evolve in mammals with the bats. It's going to evolve within the dinosaurs with birds. Um, and so we can look at these kind of key adaptations that have happened um, in, in the history of the Earth. Now, when we look at macroevolution, we are now going to start being on a geological time scale, which is a very, this is not like hours, days, thousands, this is thousands of years, millions of years, and sometimes billions of years, um, kind of looking at the geological time period. So from the Earth's beginning to the first signs of life um, until today. And we'll go over kind of the geological time scale. The one thing I want to kind of think about is, we, the, well, macroevolution, we said this is a little bit different. We're not looking at microevolution, but macroevolution happens because of microevolution. So microevolution, we talked last time about mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, natural selection. Well, if you take that plus 3.8 billion years, which is how long life has been on Earth, you then get macroevolution. So it's looking at kind of the big picture of these small changes over a very long period of time. So the fossil record is going to be absolutely essential to understanding kind of this macroevolution. Okay, we have only been alive and historically recording what we humans have been doing for a very short period of time. The Earth is much, much older, billions of years older. And so one of the ways that we're going to be able to understand life on Earth is to look at the record it has kept. Okay, and so fossils are going to be those, um, the records. They are going to be the evidence of past organisms that have lived on the planet. And the fossil record is going to then show them in order of when they were alive. And so when we look at rocks like this image right here, I want you to notice these lines. And so we have kind of these different layers and so these are going to be called strata. And in the strata, they are representing different layers of rock that have kind of been stacked on top of each other. And if an organism dies in a layer of rock and then is covered, there potentially can be a fossil that remains. And we can then look at where that fossil is and where it is really in relation to other fossils in the different layers of rock to try to understand kind of the different re historical record of that organism. So the geological time scale is going to be a way that we divide history, um, Earth's history into kind of different periods. You will not be asked to memorize what I'm going to show you uh, next, um, but it's just kind of important to, to know that there is a geological time scale. And I will mention some important events that I will want you to know. So this is the t geologic time scale. And the first thing is that it's Kind of it's got lots of writing on it but i want you to kind of look at this so this is going to be old down here so this is the oldest okay so pre-cambrian this is at the if you go to this very first statement this is 4.6 billion years ago okay and that's when we think the approximate time of the origin of earth when we come up to this time right here this is going to be the current time Okay, so you can see a little human over here. So this is the time that we're kind of in. And there are different names, and some of these might sound familiar, if you, especially if you've watched um, Jurassic Park. Um, but this oldest is going to be Precambrian. We then are going to have something called the Paleozoic, uh, the Mesozoic, and the Mesozoic within it is the Cretaceous, Jurassic, and Jurassic. Um, which are, again, those ones might sound familiar if you've watched um, or know anything about dinosaurs. And then we have the Cenozoic, 
and then in the Cenozoic we have the Quaternary Tertiary and we are currently in something called the Holocene. And so these different events, uh, these have to do with geology and kind of different time periods and kind of aging the earth. Now, if we look at kind of, so if we look a little closer at these different time periods, the first is the Precambrian. Um, so again, the earth was formed about 4.6 billion years ago. And then the first fossils of cells were found 3.5 billion years ago. Um, Oxygen wasn't really present until 2.7 billion years ago, and then the eukaryotic fossils aren't found until 1.8 billion years ago. Okay, and then we can start to see some of the oldest animal fossils, um, and then we can move on to the Paleozoic. So we have the Cambrian down here. This is uh, one time where we had something called the Cambrian explosion where we had the origin of most of the different animal phyla that we'll, um, we'll talk about in the coming lectures um, and kind of go through. There then is going to be the Carboniferous. I'll bring this one up. This is when we had kind of lots of forests. Um, this is the origin of reptiles, amphibians, um, things like that. And then we have the Permian. And during the end of the Permian, we have a mass extinction where um, kind of lots of organisms are going to die off and we have speciation of the reptiles at this point and kind of the origins of the mammal-like reptiles um, that are going to start to kind of evolve into mammals. In the Mesozoic we have the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. Um, in the Triassic we start to have gymnosperms which are pine trees. That's kind of a big um, stage in plant evolution. Uh, we have kind of dinosaurs are going to start coming about and then early mammals and birds. Uh, then during the Jurassic, we have dinosaurs are going to become the dominant life force or life group on the planet. And then in the Cretaceous, we have kind of big advances in the plants with flowering plants that are evolving called angiosperms. And at the end of the Cretaceous, we're going to have a mass extinction that is going to kill off the dinosaurs. In the tertiary of the Cenozoic, which is our next, um, this is when we have a major speciation event with the mammals, and we'll explain, talk about that a little bit. It has to really do with the extinction of the, the dinosaurs. And we can go through different times and the kind of origin of the mini primate groups, um, which we will then kind of come from, will um, be in the Oligocene, and then during the Paleocene, we have the origin of the Homo, which is going to be Homo sapiens, um, at some point. Uh, humans appear in this next stage, and then we are currently in this Holocene. All right, so in the fossil record, the way that we are able to kind of get to these different time periods and these ages is usually going to be based on radiometric or radiocarbon dating. And we talked about this seems like a lifetime ago when we were still um, seeing each other in person, but radiocarbon dating has to do with radioactive isotopes and how they decay over time. Okay. One other way to kind of look at the dates is to look at volcanic rock or ash and you can then kind of be able to infer ages um, based on um, some other kind of categories. Now, on this one, I like this image, just it's kind of cute, but it also just shows how you can see kind of how there's different layers of the fossils and they can kind of line up with different um, geological time periods. Okay, and then the one things that are on top are going to be newer, younger, things down in the base down here are going to be older. Just a little review about radiometric or radiocarbon dating. Uh, so this is the most common method for dating fossils, and it has to do with kind of uh, radioactive carbon, which is radio car um, carbon 14. And so carbon 14 will be incorporated into living organisms and over time after that organism dies the radiocarbon 14 will start to decay and start to disappear and so it has a half-life and if you find a fossil you can then 
calculate how much carbon-14 it has in it and then come to kind of the known half-lives of radiocarbon-14 and figure out how old something is. And so this would be time in thousands of years. So this allows for actual time, you know, we can say within thousands of years how, when this organism died. Now, sometimes it's not as easy and there aren't always going to be um, Kind of ways to date things so th some, at some point things do get uh, have you know you're not able to do radiocarbon dating on them um, so sometimes we do something called relative age which is we're keeping everything kind of in order and we're saying that if you're down here you're going to be older than something that's up here okay and so if you go by the different layers you can say that things that are on top are going to be younger and things that are found deeper are going to be older okay when we do absolute age that's when we do that means that we actually have a date within some range of an event happening so we're now going to kind of move on to um, more about macroevolution and kind of big scale changes that are going to affect kind of life on earth and one big thing to look at is plate tecton tectonics and biogeography so i don't know if everyone is aware of this but uh, we live on the planet on a layer of crust and i'll show you a picture of this that is basically floating and moves around it moves slowly uh, most of the time other times we can feel it move um, when we have earthquakes but all of this is kind of under this theory of plate tectonics and so the continents and seafloors are all going to be kind of on a thin layer of rock, which is called the crust, and it's divided into these large chunks that will float around on something called the mantle, which is made out of kind of this um, hot mass of viscous material, kind of like lava. When we have the plates moving, we can call it a continental drift, where we have the continents, they're moving, from one place to another and we know that during different periods of time in the on the earth different continents have been in different locations um, we can know where the boundaries of some of these plates are and they usually are going to have hot spots of geological activity we fortunately or unfortunately depending on your point of view um, live in a location that is kind of close to a hot spot because we have um, the San Andreas Fault right near us and we also have another fault um, kind of more recent I can't remember what its name is but it's the one that's had the really big earthquakes recently but these are kind of the boundaries of two um, plates okay when you have an earthquake that is showing that you have two plates that are scraping or kind of colliding with each other and mountain ranges are going to be the result of two plates kind of colliding and pushing material up. So this is what, if we took the earth and did a cross section of the earth, the crust would be kind of this outer layer. And this is where we are living, our continents, our water, our everything is on the crust level. If we go down lower, the mantle, this is fluid and it's moving. So I want you to kind of think of, if you've ever seen a volcano, out of magma um, it's going to be something that is moving it is not concrete um, and you know volcanoes are going to be places where kind of the mantle is being able to access kind of the surface um, and things like that here is a image of where the plate tectonics are so we live kind of on um, if you look at, we live on this Pacific plate. It's kind of hard to see because we live in this area right here. Um, but we are actually on a plate that's not connected to the majority of the United States. Um, it's thought that at one point, Southern California is actually going to be north of San Francisco um, because of the direction that the Pacific plate is actually moving. The line, the black lines, represent the actual plate boundaries and then uh, they all the arrows are going to show which direction the plates are moving and so if you can see this arrow right here um, it is moving kind of north towards the north pole and so that's why they think that southern california is actually kind of moving towards 
um, San Francisco slowly. Um, other places like in the Atlantic Ocean, we have all of these um, plates are moving away from each other. So the Atlantic Ocean is actually getting larger and these continents are getting farther apart um, as we speak. The Indian plate over here is colliding with the Eurasian plate and that is why the Himalayas are continuing to grow. They're kind of this collision point um, lifting those, those Himalayas up. So if we look back in time and the way that scientists do this is they look at the geological formations and kind of similarities between different continents. But we know that the continents have drifted a lot over time. And if we look kind of at this point right here, so this is going to be um, in the Paleozoic, so this is longer ago in history, we had something called Pangaea. And let me just see. Pangaea was kind of a formation or what we would call the continents where they're all basically connected. Um, that happened about 250 million years ago. When the actual continents start to move, it will affect the environment and therefore affect the organisms that are living there. Okay, because it can make it so it's warmer, it's hotter, it's colder, it has more rain, less rain. All these different things can change, which is then going to affect the different organisms. When Pangaea was connected, uh, it reduced the total amount of shoreline because everything was connected. And so you don't have like all of you know, Africa and South America and Australia and all these country continents having kind of full coastlines. They're going to be connected to other land masses, meaning there's less shoreline. They had deeper ocean basins, so these would be kind of the areas where there is no land. Um, and then sea levels kind of around the, the, the land would have been actually lower. After Pangaea, we have kind of another, this next step where we have kind of Pangaea is splitting into something called Eurasia and Gondwana. And this is going to happen kind of in the mid Mesozoic. When Pangaea started to break up, it then starts to isolate these different um, continents from each other. So at one point, technically, there were no cars, obviously, or humans, but you could drive from one side to the other of Pangaea because they were all connected. Now, once Pangaea is splitting up, and then once we get to kind of more modern day looking, this is not quite what we have today. This is present. Um, but you're going to start to have isolation. So organisms are not going to be able to go from one place to another. You're not going to be able to have, you know, migration routes. Um, organisms are going to be on different continents. And so as the land masses drift, the continents become separate. Climates are going to start to change depending on where they are. And it's going to cause organisms that were once living together to start to diverge. And so we start to have these major groups um, splitting and changing over time. So that's, these are colossal reproductive barriers because it could have a whole, whole oceans between a group that at one point was connected. Here's just an animation of what the kind of different um, continents would have looked like when they were moving. And you can kind of just watch this and see how that would have gone. So when we look at the plate tectonics and how they've affected organisms, we call this biogeography. And so this is the studying of kind of the distribution of organisms where they're where they used to be found and where they are currently found. And so we can see fossil organisms um, where they used to be found, but then if they're living in one location today, then we would say they're presently found there. Now, one of the really interesting stories is of Australia. So Australia at one point was connected to all of Pangaea, um, but it separated and is by itself. So it is an island um, all by itself. And it is going to kind of be home to over 200 species of marsupials. Um, and most of these group, these or organisms are found nowhere else on the planet. And it saw that this isolation, so once Australia was no longer in contact with any of the land masses, uh, those 
organisms started to evolve and adapt and change and therefore are only found in this location. So here's just a question. So if marsupials originated in Asia and reached Australia via South America, where else should paleontologists find marsupial fossils? And so you should be able to see fossils in Asia, you should see them in South America, and then you should find them in Australia. And so this is where we can see like that the plates were at one time all together because at this point Asia, South America, and Australia are no longer touching. You'd have to travel long distances to go from all those locations. But if you can find fossils of their ancestors in all those places, that tells you something about the land mass at that time. Now, one of the big things that happens and that we look at for macroevolution are these mass extinctions. And mass extinctions are going to be when over 50% of the life on the planet are going to die. And as of right now, we've had five mass extinctions and it's thought that we are currently in our sixth mass extinction at the moment, um, largely due to human um, effects. And so when we look at kind of the record over the last 540 million years, we're going to see these events um, in the fossil record by seeing these time periods where organisms will be in one level and then you never see them again in another fossil um, level. So one of the first that we talked about is the Permian mass extinction. And so this is when Pangaea formed. So when the continents changed and moved, it really changed the surface of the earth and it affected marine life as well. They think it claimed about 96% of marine animals, or not animals, but marine organisms um, from the planet. Okay, so it's, this image is showing kind of a dead shark. Sharks are really old. Um, this would be like an, a fossil shark that no longer living um, and some other ancient species. The Cretaceous mass extinction is the most famous mass extinction that most people are aware of just because this is when the dinosaurs went extinct. And so prior to the Cretaceous mass extinction, which happened 66 million years ago, the dinosaurs were ruling the earth. They were everywhere you could find them and you can see their fossils all in the record. But at 66 million years ago, they disappear from the fossil record and are no longer are never seen again except in the birds. And so birds are a group of dinosaurs, um, which we'll talk a little bit about them in, in a little bit. But this mass extinction that killed off the dinosaurs ultimately led to this explosion diversity event for mammals. And so what happened was the mammals were kind of being held back because dinosaurs were ruling everything, occupying the land, the sea, um, mainly the land but they were occupying all these areas and the mammals were not able to compete with them. Um, but once the dinosaurs died, all these areas were open for the mammals to move in. And so extinctions, while they kill off lots of organisms, they also are providing our opportunities for the organisms that survive. The Cretaceous mass extinction is thought to be caused by an asteroid that hit the earth somewhere in the Yucatan, kind of in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, one way that they can kind of see when this happened um, is that you can look at the kind of um, sedimentary rock in the different layers, and they have this layer of white that you can kind of see that I'm outlining. And this is white layer is actually kind of the result of the asteroid hitting the planet and leaving a layer of kind of this clay and dust. Um, it has different chemical components that are found on asteroids and um, has allowed, has kind of led to this idea that that's how dinosaurs actually died. And they've actually found the impact sites again in the Gulf of Mexico um, where they believe that this asteroid hit, killing off all of the dinosaurs that were not birds. All right, so um, this image shows the kind of mass extinction of the dinosaurs. And as you can see, prior to the extinction event, there were very few groups of mammals. Um, we will talk about the mammal species in a little bit, or groups 
Um, but after the mass extinction of the dinosaurs, you start to see this explosive event of um, kind of diversity in the mammals, specifically in the marsupials and the eutherians, which are the group that we are in. Um, the monotremes have basically, they're the platypus um, and a couple other groups. They have basically not changed much, but after the extinction of dinosaurs, these other mammal groups really kind of did well. And so we can now look at kind of some of the mechanisms of macroevolution and specifically how we can have small genetic changes that can make large differences um, in some organisms. And so, for example, this image is going to show kind of a small change that happens between humans and um, chimpanzees. And it has to do with a skull. And we think it really just has to do with slight changes in genetic um, gene expression that happens. And so when you look at kind of evolutionary biology and developmental biology, which they call this evo-devo, it's when you can see how slight changes in the genetic information can kind of cause these pretty significant differences in species. And so again, humans and chimpanzees are very closely related. Um, but if we look at our skulls, just the skulls, you can see some interesting things that happen. Um, so chimpanzee fetus and a human fetus skulls actually look quite similar. Um, they are they are different from each other, but they're pretty similar in the shape and structure. If you look at adult chimpanzee and adult human, they are very different. So the jaw, the teeth, um, kind of the shape of the skull, all of that is very different between chimpanzees and humans. And what's thought to have happened is that there's kind of this this idea of this um, pedromorphic. And what this means is kind of keeping juvenile characteristics through adulthood. And if you look at the human adult skull versus the human fetus skull, they're very similar to each other as opposed to what a chimpanzee and uh, adult chimpanzee look like. So this idea that if you kind of alter the rate or timing of certain events in, gen in the gene expression, you can actually have pretty dramatic effects kind of in the adult, okay? And so that's kind of one of the reasons why we think um, humans were very similarly related to the chimpanzee, but we've had slight changes in some genes that allow us to kind of change how our skull is shaped, basically. Another is to look at kind of giraffe evolution. And giraffes have puzzled scientists for a long time. Um, many thought that giraffes would have had, like, instead of having seven cervical vertebrae, which is standard in all mammals, um, that they had, you know, hundreds because they have these such long necks. But it turns out that giraffes actually have just the seven vertical cervical vertebra. They're just much larger. And if we look at kind of the closest relative of the giraffe, which is the okapi, um, you can see that through small changes and kind of increasing the length of the cervical vertebra, you can have the, the neck of a giraffe evolve over time. If it is going to help the giraffe feed better, um, have something to do with sexual selection, then you will have that kind of evolve. So one thing I mentioned earlier is this idea of these key adaptations that really kind of change different groups of organisms and flight is going to be one of those now one of the most important structures in flight are going to be for birds at least are going to be the feathers and feathers are adapted to be kind of perfect airfoils and allow for birds to to fly and it's kind of been a puzzle of how something like a feather could evolve Okay, so how did this intricate structure evolve over time? Um, was it always used for flight or may have been used for something else? And so if we look in the fossil record, it turns out that dinosaurs had feathers. Not all dinosaurs, because there are different groups, but there are thousands of fossils of feathered dinosaurs. And at this point, about 30 different species of dinosaurs are found with feathers. And so feathers, seem to have evolved first in um, these dinosaurs. And in this image, you can see a dinosaur with feathers 
But what they think is that many of these dinosaurs that had feathers would have not have been able to been to fly because they would have been too large and it, they wouldn't have had enough, the feathers weren't kind of the right structure. And so we think that initially the feathers were not going to be used for flight at all, but for something else. And so the first feathers are thought to potentially have been used for insulation. And so that would have been for keeping the animal warm, um, thermoregulation, and being able to kind of um, regulate the temperature of the organism. And so that may have been what they were first initially used for. But then flight was very advantageous for organism. And so if feathers could be remodeled from insulators to something that could provide an additional function such as flight, there would be selective pressure for that to happen. So structures for feathers, we think evolved for one context in insulation, but then were co-opted for another function. And this process is called exaptation. So not adaptation, but an exaptation. And this just means that you have a structure that was evolved for a different purpose, like insulation, body temperature regulation, but then was adapted for a new function such as flight. Another very complex structure that has baffled many and is usually kind of one area where people who don't believe in evolution try to attack um, is the eye. The eye is a very complex structure, but what you can see if you look at kind of all different organisms that have something like an eye, you can see kind of the gradual stages of how something like this complex eye would evolve. And so most complex structures all will evolve in very st small steps from very simple versions to something that is very complex. You don't go from, you know, a very early primitive eye to a full-blown human eye overnight. It's going to take millions of years for that complexity to evolve. But over time, with small gradual changes, you can have something very complex evolve. And so if you look at kind of the ancestry of the, the eyes from something like an eye patch in something very primitive like a planarian to a fly eye, you can actually see kind of the different modifications and how those modifications would actually benefit the owners at every stage of the process. Here is um, kind of different stages and different types of eyes in organisms that are living today from limpets that have kind of a very primitive eye to a, a squid who has a very similar eye to a human. Okay, and so through slight changes over millions of years, you can have these different eyes evolve. If it gives the organism an advantage and allows it to have more offspring and more, those offspring can have better, you know, they're more offspring themselves, it's going to evolve. So I want to just, this kind of sums up a couple different things. I haven't talked about all of these in details, but I just kind of wanted to mention um, slightly that there are other patterns in macroevolution. There's one pattern called stasis, and this is when a group of organisms just doesn't really change very much over time. And a really good example of this are sharks. Sharks are absolutely ancient, but they have not really changed much for millions of years. There have been changes and some species are no longer around, but overall they are ancient and they've lived for a very, very long period of time. We've talked about exaptation. Again, this is the adaptation of an existing structure for a completely different purpose. Um, feathers are a great example of this. We think they evolved initially for insulation and then were co-adapted for flight. Mass extinctions are going to reveal a lot of information about macroevolution when many species are going to be permanently lost and never seen again in the fossil record. And then following mass extinctions, we often have these things called adaptive radiations, which is when different groups basically just explode and start to have tons of new species. A really good example of this is after the Cretaceous mass extinction, when all of the dinosaurs went extinct except for birds, we had the mammals that moved into all those areas in the environment 
and took over and adapted and evolved and took over the the planet like the the dinosaurs had and this last um that i haven't mentioned before but i just wanted to quickly bring up is this idea of co-evolution and this is when two species interact very intimately and they evolve with each other and we have many examples of this pollination is really um, kind of a big group where you have the pollen from a flower so they have the flower the plant and then you have its pollinator a bird an insect something like that and there's an interaction between these and so for example we have a hummingbird in this image and we have these two flowers that are perfectly they perfectly fit the hummingbird so the hummingbird can put its beak down to the bottom get its nectar but while it's doing that a little bit of pollen is going to get on the head of the hummingbird and when the hummingbird goes to feed from the next flower it will pollinate for it so we have this joint evolution where two interacting species are evolving together now when we look at speciation it can take place lots of different ways but there are two contrasting models about kind of the pace of it and the first is going to be this gradual model where you have big changes or speciations but they occur by a series of very small steady changes over time okay and that would be shown in this bottom image with the graduated model um, kind of over time you still end up with the same species group you know the two different species but the way it happened is very different in the next model it's called the punctuated equilibrium model and this is when you have kind of long periods of no change but punctuated by these times where there's ex explosive events of speciation and so for the majority of this there's no change but at the very beginning there was this rapid change speciation event and then they have not changed since there so that would be a punctuated equilibria now the last thing i wanted to talk about in this lecture is the idea of classifying diversity of life the next lectures what we're going to do is we're going to start going over the different groups of life um, we're going to talk about bacteria fungi um, plants animals all of these different groups and it's important to understand how you classify them now the the term taxonom taxonomy is going to be how we name and classify our species and um, there's also going to be this term systematics which is going to include taxonomy and is going to focus on kind of classifying organisms and their evolutionary relationships so kind of seeing how things are related to each other um, and classifying them and making sure that kind of we're seeing their evolutionary history and their relationships um, i will show you a phylogenetic tree in a second um, and this is going to kind of depict hypotheses of how we believe historical speciation events have taken place and how things are related to each other so a, kind of you have a tree shape and the different branches are going to represent different species now with all of this there are hierarchical classifications of the different um, categories in the groups and so when we're looking at the hierarchy of biological classification we're going to have kind of these different levels um, what i'm showing you here in this image is not showing you every single level there is one additional level that i'll talk about in a second but from here we have kingdom which is going to be the highest classification so this one is going to be the most inclusive um, so when we say animals every animal is going to be in kingdom animalia phylum is going to be the next category it's more uh, restrictive so you have to be in certain groups um, to be in the phylum class is going to be even smaller than order family genus and species okay and i'll show you an example of a couple organisms telling you their different classifications for the most part we are going to stick in this range for kingdom phylum and class um, we don't really go over the genus and species family or order of any of the groups um, just to for just so you can know the genus and species of humans are going to be homo sapiens so um, that is our genus name and our species so genus is homo species is sapiens and so we're homo sapiens <laughs> 
So this is what a phylogenetic tree would look like. And so on the left, we have just kind of a standard, no actual species in, in here, just kind of labeled A, B, C, D, and E. And it's a tree in that it has these branches and these um, branch points. And so when you have the branch, um, when you have a connection, so two groups are going to have a, a common branch point, that means that they had a common ancestor. And so A and B would have a common ancestor, ancestor there. C and D are going to have a common ancestor there. Okay. C and D are going to be more closely related to each other because they, have, they share the same ancestor. A and B are going to be more closely related because they share the same ancestor. If we go back far enough, we can then look at the common ancestor to both of these groups. And so A, B, C, D are all going to share a common ancestor right there. And if we go even further back, we can see how the common ancestor that is shared between all of the groups, A, B, C, D, and E. Okay, and so that is going to be further back. And so these are going to tell us a little bit about how closely related different organisms are going to be. On the right side, I have a actual phylogenetic tree that is going to show kind of different dinosaurs and birds um, that we have. And some of them, you know, we have modern birds, um, but other these these other ones are either going to be kind of most of them are going to be extinct. But you can look at the relationships, and so things that are have the same branch point will be kind of the same group. So here is an example of the classification of the leopard. And so what I want to just show is the um, kind of how classifications work. Now, one thing that I didn't show earlier is this highest classification, which is going to be called the domain. And there are only three domains of life um, that we'll talk about in a couple slides. Um, but we have talked about kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And so, for example, for this leopard, they're going to be kingdom animalia, which humans are also found in, phylum chordata, humans are also found there, class mammalia, humans are in that class, and then this is where humans and um, the leopards are going to diverge. So we are not in order carnivoria, so this is going to be a different group. Uh, they're then in this family Felidae, genus Panthera, and then their species is going to be Pardus, and so they're their technical name is going to be Panthera pardus. And so this would be the classification of this specific organism. Now, one thing when we're looking at kind of classifications is we want to be able to look at different structures and see, are we seeing similarities because they're related to each other and they share a common ancestor? Or is it because they are using that structure for the same purpose? And so we're going to start to introduce this idea of homology versus analogy. And so homologous structures are going to be from in different species. They can vary in different functions and form, but they are similar because they're from a common ancestor. And in this image, we have homologous structures in this circle, where if we look at the limb of a lizard, the wing of a bird, the flipper of a whale, and the arm of a human, all of those are the same bones. So if we look at them kind of in how they develop, we're going to have the same bones and they're all going to be similar because of that shared ancestry. In this other circle, we have structures that we're going to call analogous, where they're all fin-likes and they're going to work for swimming, but they are not the same because they're not from a common ancestor. So we do not have a common ancestor that led to a whale, turtle, fish, and penguin. Okay, so those are going to be kind of different structures, um, because, and they're not from common ancestry. They're just because of how the organism adapted to its environment. Okay, so homology structures are going to be one of the best sources of information about phylogenetic relationships. So if you can track the development of certain limbs, of certain structures, and see that it actually is going to be similar to another organism that can show shared ancestry. Now, when we have the situation with analogous structures over here, this situation is called convergent evolution, where two different organisms that are not related to each other have solved a problem the same way. And so if the problem is that they need to swim in water and the way that it's happened is very similar, from a penguin, fish, whale, and turtle, 
They've all solved the same problem in a very similar way, but they're not due to common ancestry, okay? So again, there is not an ancestor that had a, a fin that then led to whales, turtles, fish, and penguins. Each of those organisms is going to evolve this fin through a different evolutionary event. And so this is called conversion evolution. And when we have conversion evolution, we call these analogies. So it's, it's similar, but it's not because of, some, um, of shared ancestry. So here is a better example of the homology so you can actually see the bones. So these are gonna be the forelimb bones of the whale, human, cat, and bat. And so you can see that they all have a humerus. They all have a radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. They have been adapted and they are no longer the same size, shape, but they are all going to start out and be what we would call humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So again, conversion evolution is going to be kind of organisms that aren't closely related that solve a similar problem in a similar way. And so, for example, all of these organisms you see are fly, they all fly, but there is not a common ancestor that flew that then evolved into a bat, a bird, and a butterfly. Each of these groups kind of solved this issue on their own and came to a similar solution, which was flight. Um, here are a couple of different groups, uh, examples of convergent evolution. So these are all gliders. Um, we have a flying lemur, a flying squirrel, and a sugar glider. All of them are able to have these kind of um, expanses of skin that they can then use to glide. They are not related to each other. Um, and so this is going to be convergent evolution. These succulents look very similar to each other. They are not closely related at all. Um, but Again, conversion evolution has led to these similarities. And this last, um, we have these prickly protrusions. So for most of us, if you looked at this, we'd be like, oh yeah, they're, they're probably closely related, but they don't even live on the same continents. Uh, one of them, a hedgehog, the other one's a kinda, they are not related to each other at all. And so they have both evolved this spiky protrusion for protection independently of each other. Now, another way that we can actually look at homologous characteristics and make sure that they are actually homologous, we can look at the embryology. So look at the embryonic form, because a lot of times embryonic development shows kind of similar um, relationships in ancestry. But we can also look at the DNA. So if we look at the DNA sequences of organisms, we can see how similar are they. Does this protein have every single same amino acid? Does this have every single base the same? Okay, and we can look at that. So in this image right here, we have two human uh, relatives. We have the, a group called the Neanderthals, we've talked about again, and then this other one called the um, Denisovian, which I have not talked about, but um, they are also human-like ancestor. And they have kind of similar genes and similar areas. Um, and we can also see this in humans today, kind of see these places where there's matches in the genes. And so we can see that both of these groups were very closely related to humans. They were not humans themselves, um, but we know that kind of they have these similarities. When you have two species that have branched relatively recently their dna should be very similar to each other and if they branched off very you know a long time ago they should have very different dna okay and so sometimes we actually do have fossils that will preserve some dna fragments so you can actually do dna analysis and see you know what the relationship is of that organism here is an uh, image kind of showing some phylogenetic Bay, um, nucleotide differences in some genes. Um, so this is a gene called cytochrome C, which is important in a heme protein. And this is going to be found kind of in mitochondria. And you can just see that very different groups of organisms are going to have similarities um, in their nucleotide sequences. Obviously, there are going to be differences, but there are similarities showing that there is a common ancestry for all these groups. Now, when we look at kind of these homologous characteristics, we can start to do something called cladistics. 
which is then grouping organisms by these common ancestry. And a clade is going to be something that kind of has some distinct structure that is then found in all of um, the, the group that follows. Okay, so ancestral species and all the evolutionary descendants that form a distinct branch of the tree life. Okay, so when you do this, you can then kind of construct classification scenes to see how this would ha happen in evolution. Now, when we do this, it is based on this idea that Darwinian that Darwin put forth with this descent with modification. So descent with modification from a common ancestor. So when we look at this phylogeny over on this other side, what we can see is we have the group of the mammals um, and we can see that they all have hair and mammary glands and then the kangaroos and beaver groups are gonna have gestation. And then uh, in just the one group of mammals, eutherians are gonna have long gestation. And you compare these to an outgroups like a reptile and see how are they different from each other. So many relationships between organisms are not apparent and it's very difficult sometimes to tell when things are related to each other because they appear very different. One good example of this is this kind of where birds belong in the phylogeny of reptiles. So initially, reptiles and birds were in different classes of vertebrates, and they were not considered to be in the same group. But the more the birds were studied, they found that birds would be found in the same clade as crocodiles. And crocodiles are going to be one clade, this one clade of, kind of group. And we have another clade that's lizards and snakes. But if you go far enough back, there's an ancestor that would have been kind of common to both the clade that has crocodiles, birds, and the clade that ends up being the lizards and the snakes. And therefore, technically, birds are going to be in class reptilia. Now, depending on who you talk to and what book you read, you sometimes will hear class aves, which is the bird, but they're no longer found in that and should be found in class reptilia. Now, one thing to mention about classifications, and it kind of comes based off of what I was just talking about with the birds and reptiles, is that things change. Phylogenetic trees are hypotheses, and they are going to be tested and falsified more and more as data comes in. And so over the course of classification history of when we first started classifying organisms, things have changed dramatically. Now, one of the first scientists that started to classify things was named Carl Linnaeus. And he divided all known forms of life into two kingdoms he called the plants and the animals. This makes sense. He was doing this back in 1735. There, you know, microscopes were still starting to come about and many things could not be seen. And so, you know, plants and animals seem like these two massive groups. Then that system lasted for about 200 years. But then there started to be other systems. And so in this chart I have on here, I have just kind of different iterations of how classification has worked. But in the mid 1900s, there started to be this two kingdom system that was replaced by a five kingdom system that kind of places all these groups, uh, prokaryotes in one kingdom and the eukaryotes in another. And there are four kingdoms of eukaryotes. And so this is kind of the more standard of what we use today. So we now have three domains of life, which we call um, eukarya, archaea, and eukaryotes. And within those uh, the eukaryotes, we're gonna have kind of four kingdoms. So again, in the late 20th century, molecular studies have kind of led to the development of a three domain system. So we have domain bacteria, domain archaea, and we haven't talked much about archaea, but we will hear about them a little bit more. Um, and then we're going to have domain eukarya, which is the group that we're in. Okay. Within eukarya, we have the protists, we have plants, we have fungi, and we have animals. And so those are going to be the four kingdoms that are going to be within eukaryotes. So the highest classification that we have are going to be domains. And then you can start to get to kingdoms in different categories like that. Okay, um, and so in the next couple lectures, all we're going to be doing is going over these different domains of life.
and talking about the different diversity that has arisen in them. And just as I said at the beginning, classification is a work in progress. And so we will always um, kind of be redoing and trying to make better these classification systems. As of right now, they seem like they're pretty solid, but this can change if there's new data.